Just a quick note before we start this week's episode, I used a bad word. Not that many of you care, most of you don't, but the show is Marxist Clean, so if you're listening with a little kid and we get to the point where we talk about Opta, just know there's a word coming. You've been warned. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Here's the show. You're listening to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. If you want to have guarantees, you have to buy a washing machine. We don't lose a match, either we win or we learn. And today we learn. And now, your host, Matt Markstone. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast and newsletter dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans available right here on SouthamptonDelivery.com. My name is Matt Markson. I am the host of the show. And no matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thanks for making the show part of your day. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that maybe, just maybe, you are able to enjoy some football this weekend, whether you're going out and kicking it around with some members of your family or you sat behind your TV and watched uh, as the Bundesliga got back underway. and. Uh, I'm not sure how you feel about it, but I hope that at least being able to watch some free-flowing and, in the case of Borussia Dortmund, some uh, high-scoring football, uh, hopefully that made you smile a little bit. Uh, And I'll be honest, I'm still conflicted. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I'm not sure how it's going to come about. But joining me to talk about that and his life around Saints is Chris Hutchings. You can find him on Twitter, at HutchFM. The link, of course, is in the show notes. And and Chris shared everything with me from how he fell in love with Saints to the lineup from the first ever live match that he was at to becoming uh, a commentator and a tour guide and now an opt-in analyst. All of the stories that Chris shared with me uh, made me smile and made me just kind of sit here and reflect on how great it is just to be a fan and somebody that's been around this club. And you think about the, you know, kind of put yourself in his shoes in terms of getting to experience some of those things. Uh, I'll be honest, after talking about the Opta stuff, I don't ever want to do that. It sounds like a lot of pressure, um, but we'll, we'll get to all of that uh, and more, including like, you know, general football climate and, and all of that stuff. But um, it was really great to talk with Chris. I hope that you enjoy the conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. Um, Chris is a really great guy. And so uh, it's just been nice to, to, to chat with him for a couple of hours on, on Sunday. And uh, you have all of this, uh, you know, this episode uh, as a result of that. So uh, thanks to Chris there. Um, we didn't talk about any of the EFL stuff um, because it hadn't happened yet. Uh, so there we go. It also appears that Premier League teams will be able to go back to training um, on Tuesday. Not not full normal training, but modified. And I didn't talk about that either because once again, uh, the announcement hadn't been made when we recorded the show. So uh, this is what you have. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, even if you didn't watch any football over the weekend, it doesn't matter uh, because it'll still all make sense because that's not the focus. The focus is on uh, the team and, and Chris's life around the team and uh, also uh, the guys down the road just a little bit. But anyway, uh, let's get to the show now. I won't hold you up anymore here. Uh, once again, thanks for listening and uh, enjoy the show. We'll talk to you soon. We'd like to welcome to the podcast, Chris Hutchings. You can find him on Twitter at HutchFM. Uh, the link is in the show notes. Chris, um, welcome to the show, and, and how are you? I'm good, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, sitting here in the sunshine in England. Yeah, it's good. Well, that is good. That is good. It doesn't, uh, you know, stereotypically doesn't happen all that often, um, but I'm glad, I'm, glad it's, it's, um, I'm glad it's happening that way, and it's been nice and warm here, a little windy, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to complain at all. Um, Normally, we don't start with listener questions, but I was just going to ask you. We have one from wood.maddog, uh, and he just says, how, how are you doing during the quarantine? That's, I don't know if anybody knows who this is, um, but how are you doing during the quarantine? Um, shall I start with the obvious one, missing football? But um, obviously, I think a little bit started yesterday over in Germany. But um, yeah, it's been strange, um, been interesting times, walked a lot more, 
with the family than I ever have. But um, yeah, working from home. So my job kind of goes on, but from home. So spending a lot of time on the laptop. But um, yeah, looking forward to talking about football. It's a bit of a rare, um, a bit of rarity at the moment in the in the current climate. Yeah, yeah. Unless it, it's really, it has been hard, and I I find myself, you know usually at school or, or I can run stuff by kids and I can run stuff by other, other teachers who, who like, who like the sport. And right now this is kind of my ideas are just my ideas and that's it. And it's hard to, to get somebody to listen because my daughter will only take a stand for so much. And my son just goes, that sounds great, dad. And it's mostly just stop talking to me, um, <laughs> which I think is, is fine. Like, that's okay. He, he, he needs some, some privacy, I guess, as a 14 year old. So, um, but yeah, I'm glad you guys are getting getting on all right, and uh, I think your your kind of uh, situation is starting to ease up a little bit. We're not quite there yet uh, here where I live, but um, are you uh, are you going to use the car now that that you can? Yeah, this week we've been allowed to drive to um, out to exercise, so that's been a bit of a change. So we can go out into the forest, staying away from the beaches because they're getting too busy. So I'm um, just being sensible and getting out into the forest. We've got. Um, those are places we can go. We're really lucky here out in the um, new forest. So we can get out there with the family, do um, two or three miles a day, catch up and um, enjoy the uh, the sunshine while it lasts. Yeah. Yeah. There, I, I would say as much as I miss football and, and life is completely just changed, there are some things that I've really enjoyed. And that means, you know, more time with, with family and just remembering like, you know, it's easy to, to neglect that stuff for me, at least I, I can get busy doing stuff that isn't really that important. And yeah, at this point you can just focus on, on a couple of things. And well, I've watched more movies with the family and just talked about movies and argued about movies and everything else. And it's been, it's been pretty great. Um, other than I have questions about movies that were made during the 1980s, but we don't have to like talk about that here. That's a different <laughs> podcast. Um, yeah, but, you can get me on that one as well, Matt. If you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, we, we, we've done all the Marvel movies, all the star Wars movies. Uh, we're currently in the middle of uh, back to the future, the trilogy. So, uh, uh got, got a lot of things going on. Um, and I, I and I never, I did, my, my thing is I fall asleep during every movie and usually on purpose. I just like, I'd rather go, I'd rather sleep, but this is, this has been good. So anyway, good stuff. Um, yeah, but Aside from all of that, uh, let's let's talk. You you do a number of things. You you've gone from you know Saints fan to commentator to analyst and having a been a tour guide in between. And so you have this kind of long history with Saints that I'm really like excited to kind of get into. Uh, but before we do any of that, like, can you just tell me your first ever like football memory? What do you remember first about the sport? Um, I kind of remember kicking a ball around with my next door neighbor when I was about five or six. I think he was about three or four years older, so he stuck me in goal. I think uh, my mum's still got some pictures of me being pounded by a, an orange ball, but I'd dive, dive around like crazy. I'm not a goalkeeper now, but um, diving around like crazy, stopping that. So I remember that when I was about five or six. And then when I was seven, about a month after I was seven, Saints signed Kevin Keegan. He was the England captain and European Football of the Year. So that's a bit like signing Messi or Ronaldo at the moment. Uh-huh. I remember that being a big time for me. Brought up uh, with my dad as a Saints fan as well. And um, the 1980 FA Cup final um, is the first one that I sat down and watched West Ham against Arsenal. So I suppose around that time, six or seven years of age, that's where it grew. And with a with a Saints supporting dad, it was always going to be Saints. Yeah, yeah. In, in your Southampton area native, right? Yeah, yeah. Just um, between... Just between Southampton and the New Forest, so yeah, yeah, banging, yeah. banging Saints territory. Oh, that's good because uh, yeah, you go. I mean, I guess if you go to Bournemouth, like that's nice. Like you know, it's the the people I met from Bournemouth on the train were nice. Like that's all I can say yep. about them. They were nice, polite people, and they were great. Um, you go the other way. We don't have, we don't want to go the other way. So I'm glad. Um, <laughs> I've I've spent a lot of time the other way, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. It's it's definitely. I have a special question for you about that. Um, anyway, uh, so, I mean, can you, I, I, as a kid, right? Because, like, you, Southampton basically signed the best player in the world at this point, or the best player in Europe at this point as a kid. Did you have any idea how good Kevin Keegan was? Or was that, it was just, it, it, or did you kind of learn about that kind of uh, as time went on or did was your dad like, look, you don't understand how lucky you are to see him or, or how, how did that go? 
Um, you only had to see the headlines in the newspapers to understand. Um, Saints signed Kevin Keegan in the February to start to, um, to play from the, the following August. So, um, yeah, I think it was a combination of my dad telling me or trying to explain how big this guy was, but also seeing the headlines on the newspapers about, you know, this is the, the guy who captains our country and he's the best player in Europe. But, yeah, for a seven-year-old, that, that kind of blows your mind. But I think I was quite lucky. It was a time when I was getting close to going to my first game. And so the, the team I was starting to fall in love with had that guy in there. So everything in the local papers and national papers was kind of Keegan-based. Okay. So um, I soon soon learned what a big story was. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm sure, especially with the the time that it took between signing him and then him coming to play, like there's a lot of time for build-up and and storylines and everything else. And especially at, at that point where, you know, TV is a thing, but also the newspapers probably played a much more prominent role in kind of uh, bringing you those things, which um, I remember, I mean, I, rem- I remember that, that as even as a kid with, with baseball stuff, like uh, us getting the paper and, and looking at that stuff and uh, a little bit more than, than we do now. Cause I don't, we don't get the paper. My kids don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so at some point you, you, you got to go to a game and it was the, your first game. Uh, I, I assume your dad, your dad was the one to take you to that. Yeah, he was. Yep. Yeah. Standing on the terrace. Um, anyone who, who remembers the Dale, uh, the Milton road end. So you'd, um, unlike today, when you get a ticket, a fair, you have to have a ticket to get in the ground. You could turn up there, but we two and a half hours before the game because you'd rush down to the front of the terrace to get the best seat. Or the best, sorry, not even the best seat, the best place to stand. Okay. So, um, yeah, good, good memories, though. We'd have to set off so early. We'd you know, scoff down lunch and then rush off to the deal. Yeah, well, see, that, that, that's, that's, what it, that's what it's all about. Uh, and I know, we know early um, you know, Sunday games for baseball, usually 105 first pitch. And so for us, you got to, you know, it's three and a half hours away. So it's like, yeah. you know, wake up before dark or uh, before dawn and then get in the car. and and just shut up and go. Um, and that, that, that was, that was my, that's my association with with that. So I understand that. Um, and, and I, and I guess, so you, so you were, were there with saints kind of all the way through, uh, the eighties and, and just as a, as a fan and, uh, your dad, obviously being, being a big fan, like what, I, I guess, can you separate those memories uh, and compare them to kind of what you've seen over the past couple of years? Like to me, because I've only ever seen football kind of in this new era of, of big money and, and television rights deals and all this stuff. Like was football a lot different back then than it is now in terms of like the experience maybe you have uh, going or or can you, can you do that for me? Yeah. It kind of felt a bit more raw and not so polished football. The football was great. And actually looking back, I have to, um, I think a lot of kids these days, probably including my own, if you talk to them about football thing that, um, Top division football only started in 1992 when the Premier League came along. Mm-hmm. But when you say, oh, let's watch a game from 1982, then it's, um, it's a bit different. But um, actually thinking back and looking back through uh, on things like YouTube and picking up the games from the 80s, you kind of see that there was, some, there was some great football and some great players. It just wasn't the polished product that it is today. But um, fundamentally, it was football. Yeah, yeah. Well... I kind of ran into that when I watched the FA Cup final for the first time, the from 1976. Like, you know, the football was good. I was expecting just lumping it from one end to the other, um, and that didn't really happen. Like, there there were a lot of big challenges, a lot of a lot of hard tackles that I, I appreciate, but a lot of of kind of one touch passing and you know, yep. uh, you know, great great kind of like through balls and things like that that were that I wasn't expecting. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's easy to make assumptions about what football was. Uh, and I'm sure there were teams who played certain ways, but Saints, at least at that point, were were playing good football even at that point in the second division. But um, you know, uh, by the time you were watching and, and going to games, were Saints were were in the in the first division uh, for the most part? Yeah, they were. They they got there in '78, and I first went to a game in '82, so they were well established. And then those early '80s, I was kind of spoiled because the first um, game I went to, we had. Kevin Keegan, Alan Ball, and Mike Shannon in the same team, which was um, dreamland for me. And also, within a couple of years or so, um, we were in Europe as well before uh, the mid-80s when English teams uh, were excluded from Europe. But I managed to get along to see um, a European game along the way as well. So I 
I'm always grateful for the time that I came into it. Even even though I was an impatient seven year old and waited till I was nine to see a game, when I got there, it was worth waiting for. Yeah, yeah. It seems like your your dad held you off until the, just just the right time. Um, yeah, he knew it. he knew something good was coming. Just a reminder all those kids, like you know, sometimes your parents just have it. <laughs> they, yeah. they have a plan. Yeah. Just let it work <laughs> out. Um, but yeah, it sounds like I mean that's that's a heck of a lineup to uh, to come into, especially for your for your first game, and um, hopefully it wasn't all downhill from there. No, it's been up and down. It, even if you look over the last five or ten years, it's been up and down. But yeah, um, thinking about the fact that when I first started watching Saints, they were in the top division. I've seen them go down to League One, back up again. So um, from one extreme to the other, and um, kind of all the way around again. So it's it's been um, it's been a lot of fun watching them, but it's been pretty painful along the way as well. And I'm sure there's um, tens of thousands of Saints fans who've um, We've watched them through the same sort of era I have and have felt the same sort of feelings along the way. Lots of emotional ups and downs. Yeah, I feel like um, you know, you could just take any of the seasons we've had the past couple of years or any any group of like three or four years in a row and then you just kind of stretch that out over a lifetime and I, it's probably pretty similar, you know. Um, although I can say, you know, it's been, I, I think for me, more up than down in terms of I've seen us play really good football. I've seen us get to a cup final. Um, and then I've just kind of sat through the last couple of years and hoped that it would end. Um, yeah, I think it has now with, with Ralph and, and everything else and, uh, nothing against Pellegrino or Powell or anything else, but I'm, I'm glad that we're not playing football like that anymore. I don't know. I don't know if you, if you agree with that or not, or, or, or anything, but no, I, you don't have to, you don't have to weigh in on that if you don't want to. Yeah. Maybe if you'd asked me on the night of the 25th of October last year, it might've been different when we'd, um, we'd been trounced by Leicester, but. I I thought all along that Ralph Ralph was the right sort of character. A lot of comparisons to um, Jurgen Klopp along the way, but I just think he's the type of character to galvanise players and fans. And um, I think for the board to um, stick with him showed a lot of sense. And um, I think I'm I'm pretty sure that's going to pay off in the long term. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it will, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how how things go this summer, um, both in terms of us offloading some players and you know, hope maybe retaining one or two or, or, or you know, the, it, it's all up in the air at, at this point because of the, the, we don't know how the season's going to play out or anything else. But um, I do have a, a, a couple of questions uh, for you about just football in general before we, we get back into all, all the Saints stuff. Um, I mean, just the, the general climate around football, did you, were you able to watch any of the, the Bundesliga matches that were on uh, this, this weekend? Yeah. Um, thankfully, um, having BT Sport, it's good. Um, so the Bundesliga coming back. I had a choice of games yesterday and um, kind of followed Borussia Dortmund. So Dortmund Schalke, the derby was on. And that was a game that I watched yesterday, which was um, quite a surreal experience. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those stadiums where, you know, I even coming to football when I did, like that was one of those teams who were, they were high flying and that, that the yellow wall was something that was, you know, it, it was something like I want to be in that at some point. Like I want to just go to a match there just to just to experience the atmosphere, and it was completely empty. You know, yeah. And, it's, a, it's on my it's on my bucket list, Matt, to go there. Yeah. Well, and it's it's tough because the the stadium holds you know I think it's like eighty thousand people, and it's sold out every time. Like it's it's yeah. it's hard to to get in there, which I think is is great. I think it really shows like what that team means to to the area, right? Like that 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 is the it's all built together, and it's part of it's part of the community and. And uh, now to have it back, I'm I'm so glad to have football back because just sitting down to watch the game was just like you could just appreciate the skill and the uh, just the passing and, and and just watching the game is beautiful. But then to to look up and and have it just be you know no there's no noise coming from the crowd whatsoever and it's uh it's it's a lot a lot different I I think yeah it is I think what was an interesting I thought it was a really clever. Um, touched by the Dortmund players at the end, they ran to the yellow wall, uh-huh. socially distanced and did what Saints sometimes do with Ralph, where they, they hold hands and then go to the crowd and keep the crowd going. Well, they did that to the yellow wall without touching. With, and there were, I think there were two, two guys in the end, two stewards in the end, and that was it. <laughs> but I just thought it was a really smart touch. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I guess, you know, I've, I've gone back and forth about, about bringing just sport in general and football back and um, kind of 
you know, I really want to watch it, but I also feel like the, there are health and safety concerns for the players. There's, um, you know, just resource concerns for, for different countries and different places around the world. And, you know, just because Germany may have enough tests doesn't mean that every other country in the world does. And is it better served? And then, so I have all these questions and all these kind of conflicted feelings because I really want to enjoy and sit and watch and, and talk about it. But, um, I mean, for, for you, I, I, what's your, what's your feeling on, as, as this, you know, kind of works towards being restarted in England and, you know, you know, what, what's your kind of feeling on, on the whole thing? Well, I think, I think over the eight weeks or so, since we had the lockdown cut in here, I've kind of swayed a bit from not feeling it was important, which I never thought I'd think that football wasn't important. But in the whole scheme of things, when you put things into perspective, football wasn't really important at that point. As we've moved further on and things have developed, I felt that if it's going to be, if it's going to be safe and along the same lines as yourself, Matt, if the, if the test can be there and it's not, and the medical um, care can be there, but not detract from where it's really, really needed. And obviously Germ Germany just seemed to get it right in their organization, in most things in life, and especially in football as well, the way the, the clubs are owned and there's a lot of support input in there. Um, it seems, it, it kind of seemed comfortable with watching it yesterday with the social distancing off the pitch. Um, and it, I've kind of got to the point now where I feel football needs to come back in some way, at some point, you can't keep play, paying players, you know, millions of pounds a year in the Premier League without doing anything. It's got to come back at some point. But the infrastructure around it in terms of the health um, side of things is vitally important and easing the players' worries about, you know, going off to see their families and, and relatives and things after the games has got to be right. And you don't want to detract from what the, the health service is doing here either. So it's it's got to be right. It can't be rushed back. But I'm I'm pretty sure that from reading the um, reports about Germany, they've they've done all those tests on it and they've made it as good as it can be at the moment. And I think football does benefit, you know, people wanting to watch football. If you can only watch it on TV at the moment, that's the best we're gonna get. And in an empty stadium, that's the best we're gonna get and the and the um you're not going to get risk-free football ever. It's never going to be risk-free from now on, I think. So if we can limit the risk, I think that's only, that's the way forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could easily be paralyzed by the fear of somebody could get it right. Like, and, yeah. Yeah. and I think for me, I'm kind of, I'm kind of on that. Like I'm almost there. Like I, I could easily see myself just shutting in and, and staying in and, and not going back to life. In, in in any sort of sense, sense of kind of normality, and I think there there's a real danger to that, and I try to be mindful of that. I also don't want to be one of these people who's, you know, uh, just refuses to to wear a mask in public or or you know socially distance because that I find myself getting really annoyed with people who are just right up on you at the at the grocery store or yeah, or, me too. You know, just and, and and I don't want to be that guy, but I'm going to. And you know, luckily I have a couple of friends and, uh, things who are, who are firefighters and they, their, their, their view on it is kind of like, look, like we, we talk all the time. I've probably had it already because I deal with it all the time. Like people are going to get it, but you know, we're, we're, you know, and they're, they're kind of not as, they're not freaking out about it. So I'm, I, I think that's making me a little bit more, uh, at ease with it. But at the same time, like, you know, I just, I, I, I still worry. I still worry about, about it all coming back, but um, I, I think there are a, a lot of issues that obviously the, the football has to deal with and, and outside of, of health, which is obviously the, the main thing is if it comes back soon and we got to get it going again, there are, I mean, there are financial obligations and TV rights deals and things that, that have to, to, to go. And I mean, do you, do you think the, the, you know, possible repayment of 30 or 40 million pounds from saints the and every other team in the, in the league and, and on down the divisions. Like, do you think that's playing a role in, in kind of pushing this to, to get it going? Like money is, is maybe a motivating factor here. I think any football fan would be naive to think that football isn't, um, money isn't a factor these days in football, probably even more so in the lower leagues because that money is vital, even though it's not at the levels it is in the premier league. Um, but the money coming into football, part of me is thinking, well, you know, early on in the lockdown when uh, the economic side was being pushed that, you know, there's too much pressure about the money. But without the money, 
we're going to see football teams dropping out of the league, dropping out of business. Right. And even the longer that goes on, even the bigger sides will start to struggle financially. And we may end up without football full stop. And I don't think any of us want that in the future. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I was never aware of was just the fact that most of these teams don't roll around with, you know, millions of dollars in the bank. Like that's not how it works. No. It, 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 the money no. has to flow through. And I know from, from talking with my father-in-law who owns a business, it's like, you know, it's not that, you know, the, the money comes and goes, but it, it, as long as it's moving through the accounts, everything's fine. It's when, when it stops moving, then we have a, a real issue. And I think, you know, saints deferring some of their wages, that's, that's fantastic. But at some point, even, even a team that's as well run as possible, like, you know, if you lose your job and don't work for two years, like you're probably going to be in trouble no matter how much you saved in the first place. So, um, yeah, it's, just, it's for Saints, it's just like getting a payment holiday, isn't it? Really? We yeah. can phone up here at the moment, phone the bank and say, the mortgage on my house, can I put it off for three months? But at some point, we're going to have to pay it. And the same with Saints, all the money coming in, they're starting to see the match day income, they're starting to see dry up, but the outgoings aren't stopping, are they? So, right. um, it just can't continue like that. And I, I think I'm starting to understand that a bit more. I know you are as well, because I know we've both been reading the price of football, I think. Yeah. And um, I'm learning a lot about spreadsheets and football, and it's really poignant at the moment in this yeah. current climate. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I should have taken a couple more math classes when I was in university. Um, but I, that, that book has been fantastic. And, the, and I don't know if you've been listening to that podcast, but it's... Yeah, I do. Yeah. It's, uh, um, it's, it's great. And I don't know where they've been all my life. Like, I probably would have got into football earlier had this, had this been a thing. Um, but you know, I think they're doing, I think that, that, that show, that book, they're all, all great. So, um, yeah, we'll have to talk about that a little bit more. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I, I, I think part of it for me too is, is, um, just not having fans in the stadium is, is such a conflict for me, especially when you talk about uh, Germany where the fan culture is, is maybe a little bit stronger and, and kind of more involved than it is in England. And the, the idea that you're going to do this kind of without the fans, it, 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 it hurts me a little bit because you watch that game, uh, you know, talk about social distancing, you know, Schalke defending, um, uh, took that to a new extreme yesterday, uh, just <laughs> failing to mark people, uh, at, at all. Um, I have a friend who's a Schalke fan and he was, uh, we were watching the game on, on zoom together and he was text in the middle of the match by a, a, a Dortmund fan, a, a friend of his, that said like suddenly the, the Schalke 04 like name just makes so much more sense. And I was like, dude, that is brutal. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, I, I, you imagine what that stadium would have sounded like with, with everybody in it, with that score line, you know, with those goals. I mean, I, it just would have been insane. And I, I'm, I miss that even as a T as a fan of watching on TV, like I, I thrive on, on that noise, like that game, it, it kind of pushes the, the game along to me a little bit and, and kind of indicates kind of how the game is going. Whereas yesterday I felt myself watching and not really, I could see the scoreline, but it didn't necessarily feel like a four nil. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I totally see what you mean. I think with the, um, in terms of the fans in the stadium, yeah, it's, it's like an adrenaline rush when you're in it, when you, and I'm sure it's like that for the players as well. Um, I was chatting with my son about, um, the stories about, in England, I think one thing they're worried about is people turning up at stadiums when they're playing games behind closed doors. I don't really see the point of doing that because if you turned up at St. Mary's on a normal match day, you could stand outside the stadium and probably work out the score from the cheers. You couldn't do that with an empty stadium. So fan, fans are vital to football, but I just think football without fans is, is the only thing we can do at the moment. That's the only way forward. And... If they're, if they're going to hear, they're going to open up games, um, more TV games or almost all the games on TV. That's a, that's a compromise at the moment. I think personally, in terms of watching games in empty stadiums, I'm quite used to it in, um, in my job that I do for Opta. Um, I cover quite a lot of under 23 and under 18 matches and I used to be a tour guide. So I used to walk around St. Mary's every two weeks, uh, just me and 20 people on a tour. So I'm quite used to empty stadiums in that way, in a strange way. But um, it's uh, I'm quite used to going to academy games where you can actually hear people uh, calling each other and the what the managers are uh, shouting out, which is not always great for TV companies because it gets picked <laughs> up on the microphone. I think there's been a few um, a few apologies from yesterday already. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're used to just working, uh, you know, at the Emirates or something. Um, nice big empty <laughs> stadium. 
we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, all of the, uh, the 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 football stuff coming up uh, now in terms of of uh, tour guides and everything else. But um, because you, you've gone from you know being a fan and and having grown up seeing you know that first ever Southampton game or match and, and that lineup, and you've gone through kind of. You know, you've been there through all of the kind of the the ups and downs of of the of the team. We just kind of talked about that a little bit, but um, if you've now gone from uh, you mentioned earlier, and we talked about it a little bit, but like you you work for Opta, you're an analyst for Opta, so now you're you're covering Saints first team games, which is um, I'm sure f- great as a as a as a fan. Just the the fact that you're guaranteed a a spot, but you also have a job to do, and that maybe that that changes the way you watch the game a little bit. I'm sure, um, but uh, where did this kind of desire to work just around the game come from? Did you, why, why, why did you go towards that instead of just standing, you know, in the end and watching the game? I think one of the first things for me was I always loved or and grew up listening to lots of um, football on the radio. Um, and then I started to fancy myself as a commentator. I used to record lots of, you know, my own kind of shows as a kid and then got on to recording some commentaries off the TV as a, as um, when I got a little bit older, and then things like um, relationships and marriage and jobs and kids take over, and then I kind of got to my late twenties, and I thought, well, I might try and make something of this, and uh, went off to a uh, a media fair in Southampton, and one of the stalls there was um, was Hospital Radio in Southampton. Cover, they they cover the um, the main hospital, so the if uh, someone goes into hospital there, they can um, pick up a pair of headphones by their bedside and listen into the, um, the hospital radio station, which is mainly music through the week, but also uh, the local hospital radio station here in Southampton covers um, Saints uh, football and Hampshire cricket as well. Okay. So I was quite interested in that. Got chatting to someone, this was in the April, um, and he said, come along. So I went along, got trained up as a presenter, and uh, I said, oh, you... I've heard that you do football commentaries. He said, yeah, there's three guys who've been doing this since the, the dawn of time um, and people wait on the waiting list to do it. And within three months, two of those guys, or one of those guys has stepped down and there was a spare seat. So um, by the start of the, the um, 2003-04 season, I found myself sat at St. Mary's talking about football. So it was a, it was a dream job, um, voluntary job but a great service to do. And at the time as well, we were also um, providing commentary to the um, the blind and partially sighted um, fans as well, okay. which has now been taken on by um, Alan March Sports over the last couple of years. But um, that's how I came into it. Um, so, yeah, it was a dream job, really, which ended up as a, a hobby. But, um, yeah, a great way to watch Saints. But um, <laughs> roller coaster of emotions, as we've mentioned already. Yeah, yeah, and that season especially, right? Like, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that is that the year we made the FA Cup final, or no? No, we got to the cup final in the May, and then I started commentating in the okay, so July, August, the following season. So okay. we got into Europe. Yeah, we were in Europe under Gordon Strachan. Okay, okay, and then relegation not long after that. Yeah, we went down 2005 uh-huh. uh, to the championship, and then. Um, a little paddle around there. <laughs> then, then, the, then the club started um, shipping money out left, right, and center. Yeah. And um, some really tough times there. But um, actually coming through it and trying to find the right words, trying to um, keep, keep people's spirits up was quite a challenge. But um, looking back, it was a great experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, dealing, dealing with that and, and trying, like you said, to, to not just – bring on a, another downer of an episode in terms of, of the, of like the podcast when we were going through some of those, some of those matches week in week out with uh, the Pellegrino, especially it was kind of like, well, oh. you, know, what, you know, how, how do we, how do we say like, you know, we tried <laughs> kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, at some point you, you moved from that and, and then added on uh, some stuff with talk sport and uh, around the FA cup. And, um, I just want to like talk a little bit about that because I I know talk sport, um, but not, I, I, I think when I see talk sport, I, I think people think it's, uh, 
some of these people say just ridiculous stuff, but they also do actually have like matched a coverage and stuff of, of, of games that is actually like, you know, listenable, I think. Yeah. The, um, the talk for stuff came in, it was, um, 2006, seven season, which was the season when, uh, the new, the new Wembley was still being built. And when it was a, um, it was touch and go whether Wembley was going to be finished by the end of that season for the FA Cup final. Okay. Um, talk, Talk Sport had put a competition out um, looking for a roving reporter. So someone with a bit of experience. At that point, I had three or four years' experience, so I wrote off and um, kind of got the gig, really. Um, so I'd do previews on a, on a Friday, go to a game on a Saturday and review it on a Sunday and write an online blog as well. So um, all, it, all the expenses paid. So I ended up going from the first round of the FA Cup all the way through to Wembley, uh, which was actually built in the end um, to see Chelsea against Man, Man United in the final, which um, I always sum up as a great day out, which is sport by, by 120 minutes of football in the middle. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there you go. Um, uh, talking about, about that kind of FA Cup journey, I mean, the, the first round, that's there aren't even, and Premier League teams don't enter at that point, right? right. Like you would have come into the third round, at least if it's the same, structured the same way it is now. Um, but uh, Obviously, you weren't covering Saints the whole time. You you were traveling around. But what's uh, what was the kind of any any memorable moments out uh, aside from the final? Well, the first round I had Lewis against Darlington, who are both now they're both non-league teams. So that was down near Brighton. So I went off down there to do that game. The one thing I remember from that game was um, there were ten minutes of added time uh, because there were there was a minute of added time. But during the first minute of added time. Um, one of the Darlington players broke his leg. Oh. So we ended up with a 101-minute game, I think, in the end. All right. Um, yeah, so that started me off. Um, yeah, it was quite looking through. I didn't actually get to see Saints, and th- people kind of thought that I got to pick the game or follow a team as they won, but they just picked me a different game every time. So I, I went to Lewis, I went to Macclesfield, Chelsea, Blackpool, Watford, Middlesbrough. Villa Park for the semi-final and then Wembley in the end. So um, the last three games, got to see Man- Manchester United. I think one of the most memorable things is going to Middlesbrough. Um, and Man United went and played 4-2-4 formation. And the four up front were Ryan Giggs, Wayne Rooney, Cristiano Ronaldo and Henrik Larsson, which was quite a sight. Yeah, yeah. And no wonder they won that game. Um, yeah. Jeez. Uh yeah, well, it sounds like they moved you all over the country quite a bit. Uh, Middlesbrough was a long day out. Yeah, it was a 5.30 sure. kick. Probably set off the round, sort of time you have to start your podcast in the morning, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it makes it more memorable, I guess. Um, and, I mean, I, I'm trying to think about some of the stadiums you got to see. So I guess you got to see some some nice, you know, some places that, that maybe some fans wouldn't get to, to do. And, and I'm sure going to Villa Park was, was uh, you know... Uh, I think that's that's one of those things that even as an American, um, yeah, we, we know that stadium uh, and look back on it, and so yeah, uh, well, that sounds like I mean, it sounds like you had quite a quite quite a journey there, and um, I mean, the the final was what it was, and but you were at Wembley, and so one of the I was probably one of the first matches that was ever you know played there, I guess. Yeah, it was the um, it was actually the week before that was the first final there, and my my hometown team, AFC Tottenham got to the FA Vars, which is one of the non-league trophy finals. Okay. So we went, we went to that one week and there were about 25,000 people there and went back the following week in blazing sunshine and there were 90,000 there. So I actually got to go there twice in a week. Okay. Like, sounds, sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so after that, uh, you wind up commentating on home matches at St. Mary's. Uh, and was that for, was that for the hospital radio? Um, uh, channel were you, were you still doing that through all of this yeah i was still doing that at the time um i was doing talk spot i was probably doing um about one game in three one game in four but at the end of that season a couple of the um the more experienced guys decided to hand it over to us young guys so from the following season onwards um we just missed out on the playoffs that year saints so in the championship yeah but then the, from the following season um there were three of us sitting in three seats so we were doing every home game from then on. So from 2007 through to early 2013, um, basically commentated on every single home game, plus a couple outside 
which probably weren't the most memorable one wasn't at St Mary's. That was the, the Johnson Paints final in 2010. That, um, I've got to commentate at Wembley, which is an incredible experience. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of uh, that, the Justice Paint Trophy, like that, I mean, can you, can you walk me through kind of that day from, from your perspective as a, as a commentator and, and, and as a fan, because obviously you're, you're, uh, you're excited about, about the match and you, I think from what I've gathered, most people were entering that day with a, a little bit of expectation, I guess, uh, around the match. People were quite uh, confident in how things were going to go. Uh, maybe angry they couldn't get a ticket or there weren't more tickets for Saints fans. But from your perspective, um, as, as a commentator, what, were your, what was your kind of feeling heading into that? Well, myself and, and one of my fellow commentators had um, done a fair bit of work because the, the radio station runs on you know, a pretty low budget. So uh, it, Osborne Radio is a charity. So they couldn't afford to send us to Wembley. So we had, the two of us decided that we'd go and find some sponsorship to pay for the trip, which okay. we did. So we kind of, it was a kind of self-made experience. So um, actually getting up there and then a few of the, um, the pro guys that we knew were a bit surprised to see us walk through the door <laughs> on the day. <laughs> and we said, you know, we've kind of got this finance. I said, we've done the work to get here. So, um, yeah, it was a, a really interesting day. 44,000 Saints fans there, which was quite, quite a sight. Yeah. Um, and yeah, a, a win was expected. It was against Carlisle and it being a pretty decent season. The only reason Saints didn't get into the playoffs that year is because they started on minus 10. Right. Uh, that season. So he didn't quite get into the playoffs. But then if you look back at the team, you can understand how we got there. The likes of, you had Kelvin Davis in goal, Jose Font, Lalana, Michael Antonio, Ricky Lambert. So, um, yeah, a win was, I think most people were expecting a win and it was a pretty comfortable one in the end. But um, it was a long day, but a really memorable one. And um, I have to give special thanks, Matt, to my, my in-laws because it was their 40th wedding anniversary. And they said to me, You've got to go to Wembley. You can miss our anniversary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very nice of them because yeah, it was. I, I would have this, I have this guilt all, all the time. Like I have this work thing that comes up every year where it, it turns into me being away for St. Patrick's day. Um, but it's also my mother-in-law's birthday. And so yeah. I'm always gone and you know, three sheets to the wind uh, and everybody else is here and I feel guilty, but she always goes like, don't worry. It's, fine. it's not, a, it's not your birthday. It's fine. And I was like, okay, fine. Like it is what it is. So when I looked uh, at the date of the Johnson and Paints final. I didn't realize until the, fo- I, the following year, Matt, um, 2011, the 7th of May, 2011, when we got uh, promoted from league one, I managed to miss my, um, my father-in-law's birthday that day as well. So I'm, I'm pretty good at taking out family occasions. There you go. Oh, yeah. Well, they still they like you though. Is that okay? They still like you. Yeah, they they still talk to me, That's... and they they are Saint supporters as well. That helps. All right. Yeah, that they they understand. They understand. I mean, he probably yeah. would have honestly traded places with you if. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty could. sure he would. Um, you've also been a tour guide at St. Mary's uh, for for a pretty extended period of time. I, I guess you know uh, I'm sure a lot of people who both from the United States and, and around the world, and, and even people that live in Southampton, would have taken that tour at least once just to just to do it and i i guess for you what was that what was that experience like was there any any kind of times that really stand out to you in terms of uh you know touring and, and th- things like either visitors you remember or just uh different things happening during during the tour yeah well i took a break um kind of early in the pochettino reign um from commentating it was quite a commitment to commentate on every game yeah um and the the tour guiding um, really for me was every time Saints were away there'd be three or four tours a day on the Saturday around the stadium um, and one of the guys from the Saints Foundation said to me well you, you know plenty about the club well then you carry on talking about it and take people around the stadium so I did um, and I think it was about about 18 months into that uh, sort of summer of 2014 I had a phone call from the club to say could I do a tour a one-to-one tour uh, for a guy uh, what the club had done, they'd asked people to write in with their stories about how they fell in love with the club, and um, they they pay for um, a season ticket for them. I think they picked four or five people. It was a pretty generous prize. Wow! But well, one one of the guys that got picked was um, turned out to be the head of the Bulgarian Saint Supporters Club, and he'd never been to England. Um, so he said, "Well, I'm not going to use the season ticket." So they the club, to be fair. 
um, flew him over and um, brought him along to a pre-season friendly. I, I think it was uh, again. I think it might have been Bayer Leverkusen, one of the German teams okay. at the time. Got me, um, got me to go there pre-match and take him around the stadium. And um, his knowledge was incredible. I said to him at the end, his English was great and his knowledge was amazing. And a bit like yourself, he he um, picked up the team. He picked up the team in the kind of Matt Letizia days, but he'd gone back and researched and, and watched videos and he knew as much as me. And I said to him, you could come, if you ever come to England, you could do this job. <laughs> but, and, and I actually got, um, I've got a, I've still got a copy of the web page of the Bulgarian Saints uh, where they did an article about the tour with me. Awesome. But um, yeah, it looks a load of nonsense. I have to just always remember to click the um, translate button. Yeah. Go <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was quite an experience. Amazing man. But um, just as we were finishing, the players were turning up um, in the car park. And it was like watching a six year old kid getting autographs um, when it, the way he was going over to them. So he kind of said bye. I said, I'll let you get on with it now. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was an element. First time in England, come to come to St. Mary's for the first time, and then all these um, all these stars were turning up. And I, last I saw him, he was chatting to Ronald Koeman and his brother. Oh, well, there you go. Um, so that was great. Yeah, that was a great one. But yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's great. And just a, it's a it's always a, a, a kind of a nice reminder to me that there there are people all over the world that support this team and for one reason or another have come to find it. And uh, when you can kind of just connect with them and hear their story, it's always. I don't know. It makes it makes you feel good, at least at least to me. And so, um, I think that that's that's fantastic. And it's nice that uh, and it's nice that he got to do that, and the club did that for him, and and you got to be a part of it as well. Yeah, it was brilliant. Great experience. Yeah. Um. So so next kind of phase of of your life, and we'll we'll uh in terms of football, um, you move to Opta, and Opta does this analysis that I you know. I find it, I, I consider myself lucky when somebody publishes something that's using all the Opta data because I can actually look at it. Um, but uh, Opta has people all over stadiums everywhere doing this kind of this, this analyst job, I think. And you started doing it, but why don't you just, we'll just start with like, what is, what is your job on a match day for Opta? What, what, what is it that you're exactly that you're doing? If, and don't share like the secrets, but like you, if whatever you can tell us. Yeah, I am. Um... The the actual job title is an in ground analyst, which sounds fairly grand, but it just means that I analyze and I'm inside the ground. So as you <laughs> as you said <laughs> as you said, Matt, um Opta cover at the moment they cover the Premier League, the whole of the Football League, uh the Women's Super League as well, the FA Cup, the League Cup, and the um what was the Johnson Paints trophy, the Football League trophy as well. So every game that you see in those competitions Opta will have someone in the press section in the ground. They also cover all the under-23 um, academy leagues and under-18 academy leagues as well. So my my job, um, Premier League games are slightly more straightforward for me than doing a, an academy game. I do games at St. Mary's, but I also cover a lot of the under-18 games down at Stafewood at the training ground as well. Okay. Um, so if I, I kind of talk about the under-18 game because a bit more work to it for that, I turn up and um, team sheet you get about an hour before the game. And I'm, what I'm really doing, rather than uh, seeing the stats, I'm kind of the messenger for what's happening on the pitch. There's a guy at the other end in Leeds. I'm telling him, really, there's a, um, a map of the pitch with numbers, numbered squares on there. So if there's a free kick or a corner or a foul or a throw-in, um, or a penalty, or a shot. I have to call where that is um, and who's carried that out. So if there's a foul, and we have to keep it quite brief, obviously, um, in terms of getting the message across. You know, it could be in zone 63, uh, red foul, red three on blue three, something like that. So I'm calling it, and there's a guy, I can always picture the guy at the other end is bashing away on a touch screen. And what he does on the touchscreen generates those stats that you'll see on the TV or in the newspapers. Yeah. Do, do they also do like, you have to worry about passes and stuff like that too? Um, not so much in the, in the 23s and 18s. They, they don't really cover the passes. Okay. When you get up now into the Football League and especially in the Premier League, the guys at the other end, when I do a Premier League game for Saints, um, 
the guys in Leeds are watching a, feed, a live feed of the game as I'm watching the game. Uh, what you what you don't notice so much on the TV, unless um, you know someone like me points out to you, is how many times it it goes off camera. So if someone takes the ball goes out for a goal goal kick, and they they cut to Matt Letizia sitting in the director's box. Okay, when they cut back. The ball's probably gone 50 yards up the pitch, being headed by two people and gone out for a throw-in. So I'm calling the, their shout off camera and I'm calling the off-camera stuff. Oh, um, okay. This, this season, I'm, I'm calling the VAR um, things that are coming up. So I'm getting a little, just giving them a little uh, prompt ahead of VAR coming up, giving them a prompt of who's ready to come on. Um, sometimes with the yellow cards, red cards, it's not always straightforward to see. So in the way that I, I think you mentioned a little bit earlier about how I watch the game, um, I watch the game uh, differently now to what I did as a commentator and as a fan. Now I actually watch the referee a lot because I can't really afford to miss him whipping a quick yellow card out Yeah. or, or why he's given a foul. So I might get a query in my ear, has that been given for handball or a tug on the shirt? They'll look back at the replay, but I might just see the referee just, you know, put his, touch, his, touch his arm or just tug his shirt just to show what's happened. And I'm actually on the other side of the ground to the TV camera, so sometimes I'll, I'll get a better angle on things and just give the guys a heads up. And if, if the feed was to go down the TV feed, then I'd continue giving, feeding them the information. Man, that sounds, that sounds intense. Um... It is, it, you've got it. That, that is the word. When I commentated, I used to commentate from uh, two of us would commentate with the summariser. So I'd do minutes 0 to 23 and 45 to 68. In this, I'm doing minute 0 to minute 90 plus yeah. on my own and talking about everything, especially in the, the academy games when there's no cameras there. And I remember the first game I did for Opta um, a couple of seasons ago, um, I turned up under 18 game and it all seems quite quiet and leisurely a bit like football's going to be on the TV at the moment um, and uh, there, was, there was a goal up for three minutes and Saints under 18 lost 5-2 to Tottenham and I was I was absolutely shattered yeah <laughs> so yeah it takes a little bit of time to get used to it but um, yeah I can't complain I get to watch football and get paid for it but it, yeah intense is the word if I if I summed it up in one word you've got it intense yeah I I no idea how, how that, I mean, I had no idea how it happened and now I have a little bit of an idea, but I almost just want to put the curtain back and not think about it and just go like, you guys are doing a great job. So keep it up, you know, cause it's, that sounds, it sounds crazy, man. Like, well, I think if, even if when the Premier League come back, Matt, and you're watching that game where you are, you could think of me, um, as we get late in the game, I'm probably sweating away, you know, <laughs> and, calling, and I'm just going for my second cup of coffee. Decision. Yeah, and I'm still calling VARs and substitutions to someone. Yeah, uh, you know, Franny Benali, two-footed challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Space, uh, you know, spot 68 or whatever it is. Um, yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, so that's, that sounds like, uh, it sounds like a lot of work, but it also sounds like, um, and, and like you said, a new way to, uh, to do that. Um, and if, if, if it could be uh, worse, um, they sent you down <laughs> to cover the other end of Hampshire uh, yeah, the, yeah, the dark side, as I call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, with the recent Star Wars, uh, you know, journey I've been on, that sounds good. Um, except <laughs> for they were really good. The, the strong, the dark side was, and like I don't, I don't really want them to be strong. But um, the fact that you don't put together the stats means my next question doesn't make any sense. But I'm gonna ask it anyway, and I'll just say parental, parental advisory here. Um, so that season that you were down there, like statistically, like how <laughs> are are Portsmouth? Um, Maybe I'll, maybe I'll try and be a little bit fair to them. It's more about the division than the team. The ball's in the air a lot, a lot more. I kind of, I kind of likened it when I, when I got to watch League One football week in, week out or every fortnight at Portsmouth. I remember taking my son to a a non-league game when he was about six or seven after he'd been watching games at St. Mary's in the Premier League. And he said to me, this is like a game of tennis because the ball's in the air so much. Yeah. And that's the one big difference. The ball's in the air a lot. You, and when the problem is, Matt, when, you, when teams come in League One normally, and you see, I've seen it happen, they try and play from the back. And no disrespect, but without the quality of players, they give goals away. Yeah. So it's quite, I, 
as soon as a goalkeeper would play it, especially with the new uh, goal kick rule where you can kick it, uh, players can come into the area to gather it from the goalkeeper. Uh-huh. Uh, when I did some Portsmouth games, I did a couple last season as well, but um, when you saw a League One goalkeeper play it short, then you're thinking, there's going to be a chance coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, Pom- Pompey in the first season I did, so 18-19, yes, they did send me there. And um, I'll have to be t- completely honest, the most satisfying Saturday afternoons were when I was walking out, having called a Portsmouth defeat. <laughs> But on my phone, it was coming up that we just won two nil away at Cardiff. Yeah, and um, that was satisfying. And one big highlight, if I can tell you about there, was um, during that season, uh, Jake Heskith, who's one of the Saints youngsters, mm-hmm. was on was on loan at Burton Albion, and they played away at Portsmouth on a Tuesday night, and um, he scored a brilliant goal. He cut in the area, beat four players, smashed it in the roof of the net. Mm-hmm. And he celebrated like anything. Jake Heskiff is a Saints fan at heart. <laughs> and under the desk, I was punching. Yeah. I was, and, and just to cap it all, uh, I think the following day, Saints tweeted the goal out. I, I, remember, I remember that, that, uh, that highlight that was, in the it celebration. Was just, it was superb. It was superb. Yeah, but you can't, you can't celebrate too much because it uh, won't, won't, won't go well. Um, no, it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but but, I, yeah, I, yeah. but I'm also sure that there are just because of, I, I think the way the nature of, of how this, this works is you wind up probably with Portsmouth fans working, you know, things doing something on a match day at Southampton from time to time. It just, it does happen, but you still, you got to keep it under wraps. I think. Um, yeah. When I, when I did uh, the season, I did at Pompey their uh, press. I got to know their press guy really well, who did the Twitter feed, which is also quite useful to me as well that I follow in case, um, you know, in terms of if there's a really uh, a question over an assist or a yellow card. Mm-hmm. So we kind of play off each other, okay. uh, myself and the press guy. But it turned out that he, he um, lived just up the road from me in Southampton as well. So we kept that under our hats. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, you don't, don't, don't let that get out. Um, <laughs> and, I, and it's not like everybody puts up a sign, like signs in their driveway of what, what team they, they, they support, I'm sure. Uh, no, absolutely not. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be a good call. Um, so I guess I have a couple of questions about about just watching the game that way, um, because I and I know Carl Anker and and a, and a couple of other people like sometimes I I look at at statistics and I think maybe this comes from from watching baseball uh, for so long where where a bit, like statistics are 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 just a way of life and and it, it's kind of how the game is run now um, the NBA as well like the you know just the the reliance now on on three point shots it comes from analyzing the game and and from a kind of almost an economics point of view in terms of um you know the chances you have and the the everything else and and what you do with that but um i mean do you now look at certain players and just go like that guy is is actually better than we think he is statistically or or not as good or do you do you once you do your job do you not look at that stuff anymore and you just kind of go back to trying to just watch the game as a, like when you get to watch it on TV, you just kind of watch the game instead of trying to, to, to call out where the foul was or, or how many passes are going or, or whatnot. Um, I think, I think one thing that I've um, found is that you kind of, un, un, there are positions in football that are underestimated. So, you know, forwards will always get the headlines because they score the goals, mm-hmm. but um, <clears throat> you'll start to see how much play goes through midfield. And I remember, um, watching uh, Jorginho for Chelsea, who's, who's had a kind of up and down time while he's been at Chelsea as a defensive midfielder. But you kind of look at players and because you're watching so intently as an analyst, with a commentator, you're following the player across the pitch. And you, when the ball goes into midfield, sometimes you can, you can kind of uh, quiet down a little bit because it's probably going off, it's going forward or it's going to go sideways. When you're watching intently to what's happening. You're watching the ball, you're watching the referee. Um, when the player's going through a Jorginho in midfield, you kind of appreciate what these guys do in terms of breaking the play up um, and making the play start and dictating the speed of the game as well. So those underrated players, you kind of... An example, I think a popular example is James Milner. Sort of guy who doesn't get the headlines, but his team doesn't tick without him in there. 
Um, and I think they're the kind of statistics that interest me now because I see those players in not in the glamorous positions. Even with the fullbacks, you see the amount of time fullbacks get up and down. I see it even more in the academy games where I'm calling the academy games and you're seeing how many times guys get down the, down the line to cross the ball in and how much they're in the play and how much work they do. Um, so it's kind of, I think it's, I've gained more respect for those positions outside the glamour positions like the, you know, the playmaker and the forward. It's the, the fullbacks or the defensive midfielder. You kind of realise how much uh, important um, part of the team they are. Yeah, yeah, and and especially you know with us only, you know, really watching on TV, you, you the ball uh, the focus is often on the ball and on the forwards and and kind of they're trying to make sure that you see the goal. So sometimes you miss some of the build up play. Um, yeah, and you and you it's easy because a lot of stuff happens off camera, right? Like, um, and and just player movement and everything else that you don't you don't recognize as a as somebody watching on TV. And I've I can say that when I've seen games in person, it's almost overwhelming um, the number of things that are happening on the pitch. Um, just as, as somebody who's so used to just seeing it on TV and, and even, even when you play, like it's, it, it, it's a little bit different and I get super focused on my one job, which is don't, don't screw it up. Um, but that, that, that's hard sometimes. Uh, but also I, I have to say you, you, you warmed my heart with the James Milner comment. Cause I, 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 I love that guy, which is not, People are like, well, some people say like, that's okay. And some people just say like, you're, you're weird. And that's, that's fine too. Um, no, I, I've got a lot of respect for anyone who follows him on Twitter. Yeah. He's an absolute legend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone who cuts their grass with scissors yeah. <laughs> and, can take the, and, and take the mickey out of himself as much as he does is, is, is a lot of respect for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's fantastic. I, I, I think he's great. Um, anyway, uh, I, there is there there was a little situation at Saints that we should probably address at least a little bit, um, and that's that's the Hoiberg situation that came up uh, this week where he had an interview where he said he wants to play at uh, at a higher level, um, and and people have taken that to mean that he is looking for a move. Um, I wrote about it in the newsletter a little bit of what I think it would mean for us to lose him. Um, you know, his contract expires at the end of next season, which means next January he can essentially sign for free, which means that if or he can leave uh, for free and, and look, start look, looking at teams. But that means this summer, um, depending on when that transfer window actually opens and what happens, he, we could potentially see him gone. And uh, from, from your perspective, he's the, he's the captain. Um, I think he's done a great job in midfield over the past couple of seasons. Um, he is not like, like, I wouldn't call him a glamour uh, position player. He's not, he's not an attacking midfielder. Um, but I, I think, uh, he, I think he's vitally important to the team. And, and especially I think what he did for me was when we were going through those kind of poor times, he was the guy that was constantly in front of the camera when he wasn't the captain, he was the guy that was showing up. And for me, that means a lot. Um, but, but for you, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on how this should, this should go? Like, uh, did we sell him this summer? Do we let him leave on a free at the end of next year or, or do we try to convince him to stay? Or, and what, what's your kind of take on it? Well, looking at the, I'm going to go back to stats. It must be my natural viewpoint now, Matt. I've gone back to stats. Look, I looked at the stats and he's, he's missed out. There, were only, there was only one league game he didn't play in this season um, for Saints. He, he didn't score any goals um, he, and he got five yellow cards. So it doesn't say a lot on the, on the, um, on the basics, on the stat sheet. Yeah, but in, a, in the same way as I, I mentioned about those kind of unsung players, he is a player who holds things together and drives teams forward. And he's, he's t I think he's turned into a, a great captain in that team. He, you can see the passion from him. Um, and you can see him, as you say, anyone who fronts up when the team was going through the sort of run we were. And um, I'm quite fortunate in my opto role. One thing I have to do at the end of the game to um, just to clarify the... Um, not so much the goals, but the cards as well. I have to go down to the um, press section or the end of the tunnel where the interviews are going on and grab a copy of the referee's report. Okay. So I have to, I have to hang around there while people are being interviewed. And he's a guy who always will step up to the plate. Um, he does. Um, Stuart Armstrong's another player who does that as well. But Hoy Beer, as a captain, never afraid to come out and front up in front of the camera. I think the, the fans are really warm to him in that way. But this one year to go is also the option that he could buy himself out of his contract as well with a year to go. 
Um, I kind of think if a, if a player comes out and expresses the type of desire he has to leave, then you kind of feel his heart being pulled away from Saints. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's not many players who've you know, been given maybe someone come along and say, we'll give you a bit more money, stay another year or two, and then you can get your big move. I think the real exception was Snydlin under Koeman. Mm-hmm. Um, he was dead set on going. It was almost signed and sealed to think he was going to go. It was going to be Tottenham or Man United. And then they, they talked him into staying for a year and he probably had one of his best seasons with us. And really, and that gained a lot of respect for him. Yeah. Um, it's a dangerous game, I think. Um, do they trust Hoybeer to come up with that for a year if they can talk him into staying? I'd love to see him stay. But I can understand if silly money comes in for him at this time and it's obvious he wants to move on, um, that he does go. But if the money's right in current football and you can get the right replacement, and we've also got, if you, if you see the kind of, I'd say the re-emergence of Wolf Prowls, Armstrong as a player I think has been underused, although Ralph has really um, brought him to the fore in the, um, the second half of the season. I think, I think we can get there without him. Um, I don't want to see him go, but I just think coming out publicly and hinting, I want to see some trophies, even if he is talking about Tottenham, which doesn't really tally up, um, then um, it's, the only, it's the last chance to cash in and then find a replacement with the money. So um, he's, he's obviously seeing that stepping stone. Um, he's been at a big club before at Bayern Munich. Mm-hmm. Didn't quite work out there, but he's obviously got his mojo back and he feels he can go back to the top level. So I think if the right big came in, you've got to seriously consider it because of the way he's come out and, and said, I think I want to move on. Yeah, yeah. And especially given he is the captain. And if the captain's heart is anywhere but in the right place, like all of a sudden things get, you know, that, that's not great because you need, I mean, even just playing the game, you need everybody completely focused. And we've yeah. seen in the, we've had instances in the past where people just haven't been, their mind, mind hasn't been right to be in the team. And, and that hurts the team because the, obviously if you are a starter and you are the captain, like the, that's based on quality that we're not just, kind of shoving people in that role because we, you know, we like you a lot like that. You know, uh, I don't, I don't think Ralph operates that way, especially just looking through the team. I'm pers- from a personal point of view. I like a captain through the spine of the team, mm-hmm. ideally a defender or midfielder, yeah. a forward if they're exceptional and looking down the list of the squad in terms of players who've really made, um, made an impression on the team, won the fans over and are there for the future. I'd say you've got three candidates if he did move on. Stevens, Wolf, Prowse, or Rings mm-hmm. would be great captains. So I think captaincy-wise, we could cope with it. Yeah, I, I, I wonder. You know, I, I think, I think Ward Prowse. The problem with with the only problem I have with any of that is Stevens. I'm almost willing to bet that many fans would say we can do better than him in defense, like. Yeah. You know, and so if he's not in the team, that's a problem. Ward Prowse, I think, still to this point, even uh, divides opinion a little bit. Um, but I think he's really shown that he can do he can do that job in midfield. Like, I think he's hopefully found his best position. I think we've been saying that for for a while. Um, yeah. You know, can can we find his place? So I think I think he's definitely there. Um I almost don't want to burden Ings with it, you know, and maybe, maybe he would respond to that very well by, um, you know, because it's, it's kind of his, his childhood club and, and everything else. But I also just don't, I, I don't want to change anything about what's happening with him. I just want him to keep playing. Um, and sometimes that, that captain's armband fits different people, different ways and weighs on different people, different ways. And I mean, I remember when Bertrand had it, he just, it was terrible. Like his, his performances did not improve. He didn't, he wasn't really the leader that we we wanted, even though I liked the guy. Um, just wasn't it wasn't a good fit, and I was glad to see when when it moved away from him, um, because I think I think it fits Hoiberg a, a little bit better, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I see what you mean about Ings. The thing with it, the big things with Danny Ings, I I can completely go with the fact that his heart is at the club. He wanted to sign for his hometown club, and he's proved himself mm-hmm. more than enough at his hometown club. The more you know, if we look at those three players, um, Ward Prowse, even though he comes from Portsmouth, yeah. he has 
if you're going to win, if you win the Saints fans over after um, coming from the other side of Hampshire, you've done something right. And he's, I think he's really kicked on as a player. And as you've said, he's spent a long time a bit in the a bit in the wilderness trying to find his best position. But I think Ralph's found it for him now. And um, probably out of the three, if I really had to pick one, it would be Wolf Prowse to take the armband. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I would go with that. Um, well, Chris, I mean. Is there anything else you want to you want to talk about? I think I think we covered uh, a lot, but we I may have very well missed something. Um, no, I could probably talk too long that as we both could about Saints and and football, even when there is no football. And how much uh, the thing is the thing is how much would we talk if football was on at the moment? Yeah, but, um, hopefully hopefully it won't be too long, and um, we might be seeing Saints back out there again to um, finish off the season. So um, I just one thing I did wonder about. Uh, was the um, I know the the talk of teams playing at neutral games has kind of gone away now, and they're talking about playing the games at uh, teams grounds. But actually, I don't think it would have been a problem for Saints because uh, <laughs> looking at our home record, we we won we we've, we've got more we've got twenty points away in fourteen at home, which is incredible, really. Yeah, and we've got our goal difference at home is minus fifteen, and goal difference away is minus two. So. Um, I don't think it matters where Saints play as long as Saints play somewhere. Yeah, I was looking, um, you know, points away from home were one of the highest in the league. Um, yeah. You know, kind of just uh, maybe behind just the, the teams at the very top of the table. So it's, uh, you know, I take it. It's fine. Let's, let's, let's go uh, uh, anywhere, anywhere. It would be fine. And not to, there's nothing against St. Mary's. It's just for some reason, it just hasn't happened there. And I think it's, um, you wonder, you know, because it's sometimes the way teams set up and attack and, and do that. And you wonder how, not having a crowd will affect uh, some of those teams if they're going to, you know, because if you're playing at home, you know, or if you're playing on the road, you got to kind of, you know, account for certain things. And maybe you sit back and play slightly more defensive and, and look to counter. Whereas if you're playing away or if you're playing at home, you, you shift that. And it doesn't, does it matter if there's no fans? Like, you know, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how it all, how it all works. So we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. And you'll have to, you know, you have to let me know how it is when, once you're in the stadium and, you know, it's just you and you're, you know, how six or 12 feet away from whoever's next to you. And I guess with yeah, the stadium empty, they can just spread you out all around the stadium. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You, yeah. You think so in terms of um, the press section is going to be limited. I think in Germany, they limited it to about 300 people in the ground. Uh-huh. So um, yeah, just be me and my, my guy in um, Leeds on the other end of the phone and um, a few hundred people in, and the players. So it's going to be an interesting experience, but, um, and I think as we said earlier, for me, any football is is something at the moment in, in context. And if it if it can't be without a crowd, it it just can't be without a crowd. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I I will say the positive about there not being any football right now is that we got to talk about a lot of other stuff that maybe we would have had to rush through or not been able to explore as much if if there was a game to talk about. Um, so I'm I'm gonna take it as a positive, and it was uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I I just appreciate your time and. Uh, I do have to say on the record, I am sorry because you were supposed to be on like for the last game that we actually had. And I, I screwed something up. So I apologize for that. I think we got locked down that week as well. Okay. So, um, yeah. Bad week all around. A, a lot, a lot of stuff was going on that week. So, um, yeah, probably, probably best to, um, come back now, get all the, get all the, um, talk of around the periphery of football out of the way. And then, um, and maybe, yeah, talk Saints when um, they do get back, and I can tell you about the, what the um, the new normal stadium experience is, Matt. I look forward to it, man. Um, if anyone wants to follow you on Twitter, they can do that. You are at Hutch FM, and the link, of course, is in the show notes. But uh, Chris, just thanks again, and I really appreciate your time, and it's been a pleasure to to chat with you. Thanks, Matt. Brilliant. that does it for this week's episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. I also hope that maybe you potentially heard and enjoyed uh, my son yelling at Fortnite from upstairs, my daughter coming in and out of the house, uh, the dog barking right now, um, although maybe I can silence him, uh, my wife taking a shot while on a Zoom call for work, and uh, whatever else you might have heard in the background. Um, Welcome to quarantine podcasting. But in all reality, it was a lot of fun. So uh, anyway... Special thanks this week goes out to Chris Hutchings. You can find him on Twitter at HutchFM. It was fantastic just to hear some of the stories. Uh, somebody who's been around Saints for so long in so many different capacities. Uh, just, I don't know. It just makes me smile. Um, so whether the goals from Borussia Dortmund made you smile or cry in the 
the case of Dave Lee. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the episode and had a good weekend and that you're having uh, a, a good week as well. This show would not be possible without you as a listener, so thank you very much. If you are enjoying the show, please rate and review the show on iTunes. It helps other people find out about the show. It gets recommended to them based on the ratings, so please do that. That is very, very helpful. You can also join the group of fans who support the show on Patreon over at patreon.com forward slash SFC delivery. There are details there, and if you have any questions, just let me know. The show would also not be able to go on without the partners of the page, the Southampton page on Twitter and Instagram. They are at Southampton page on Twitter and at Southampton page one on Instagram. They keep us all up to date with everything going on around the club. The logo for the show is done by Matt Beeling of the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. So be sure to go and check that out. All music for the show comes courtesy of the Free Music Archive at freemusicarchive.org. The intro song is Epic Song by Boxcat Games and the end of show credits that will be ending soon. His aim is true by Pottington Bear. If you want to get in touch with this show, you can do that. We are at SFC D E L L underscore I V E R Y on both Twitter and Instagram. You can get links to all that and more over on the show website, SouthamptonDelivery.com. That is it for this week. We'll be back with another episode next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope that you've enjoyed it. And until next time, remember that together, we march on. We'll be right back.